Hi, I'm Dave. Welcome back. I'm still talking about the Wheel of Time. So, in this episode, I wanted to spend a little more time, yeah, jokes, talking about some of the more particular thematic issues in, in the Wheel of Time. So, maybe it's worth starting with a, some of the common criticisms that I hear just like trolling through the internet. Uh, the first one tends to be about the plot and how it really sags in the middle of the series, especially from books like 4 to books 10. Uh, and that is true, <laughs> first of all. Uh, the plot gets really glacial, and, and especially in book 10, I think, is where, people, where I got kind of mad about it. Um, but, yeah, I think that's a, a really interesting criticism to make because it hints at... A larger and weirder issue, which is why does fantasy lend itself to that kind of sprawl? And this is something that we see in lots and lots of books, and it's, it seems like not an isolated trend. So I want to spend some time talking about that, maybe in a later episode. Uh, the second common two, number two, the second com common criticism I want to spend some time with today uh, are the weird character ticks. So, for example, uh, Nynaeve has that kind of like braid tugging thing, and this is this is a braid braid tug. Um, uh, the women are always smoothing their skirts or f folding their arms under their breasts, um, and this understandably turns people off. I think it was intended to be uh, little character quirks that ended up being these kind of stylistic ticks uh, that made the characters less likable than they would otherwise have seemed, maybe, uh, or else uh, just started bugging people. Uh, and that makes sense. Uh, but that critique is interesting to me because it, it points to some larger issue, which is uh, the role of gender in, in The Wheel of Time, which strikes me as both interesting and really intentionally done on Robert Jordan's part, but also sort of weird and a little unsettling or something. So that's, that's where I want to go today. Uh, okay, so first, maybe a little context for, for The Wheel of Time. So the first book um, was published in 1990. Uh, Robert Jordan, according to Wikipedia, was starting to write it in 1985, I think. Uh, so this is the time when the second wave of feminism was just about kind of coasting into the, the third wave. Um, and so just to give a small example of how, what the kind of cultural critique of the fantasy genre was at the time, uh, I have a little excerpt from this handy book called The Language of the Night. Um, and it's a book of essays by Ursula Le Guin. It's really actually pretty awesome. Okay, so here's a, a brief excerpt from an essay called American Sci-Fi sci and the Other. Okay. Uh, the women's movement has made most of us conscious of the fact that science fiction has either totally ignored women or presented them as squeaking dolls subject to instant rape by monsters or old maid scientists desexed by hypertrophy of the intellectual organs or, at best, loyal little wives or mistresses of accomplished heroes. Male elitism has run rampant in science fiction. So whether or not this is... Aw, oh, man, my cat wants in on this. Hang on. Cat, I'm going to scoop you up. Zoom. <sighs> She's like, I want to talk about feminism. American sci-fi and the other. She's got, She's got things to say on this subject, so she'll speak up if she feels like it's necessary. Uh, okay, so this was an essay that was published in 1975. Uh, so already, and already she's saying like this is this is kind of an old critique. So you know, in, in contemporary fantasy, you know who who knows about the state of of gender? <laughs> like that's that's a whole other issue. Uh, but probably in 1985, Robert Jordan was really aware of of this issue, um, and and was really presenting, I'm sure, um, his first book as. Um, or, or pitching it against against these critiques, and so maybe I'm just gonna uh, list out five ways that I'm seeing Robert Jordan um, um, sort of countering or uh, addressing the, the you know the, the the sins of his predecessors. Um, so if I'm if I'm like gazing down here, it's because I've got a bunch of notes. Um, so that's what's happening. I'm 
crinkle this paper, paper a little more. Uh, so that's really audible for you. Uh, okay. So the first way we see this this happening is uh, in the world philosophy itself, right? I mean, maybe we can take you know, he takes the the yin yang as as the symbol for the world and and uh, for his magic system and, and philosophy. Uh, so what he means by that is is just a sort of unity of of men and women that are both equal in in in, in influence but also sort of separate right there are two colors that don't overlap um, and that's just everywhere in the book the sense of balance even in something like the local politics <laughs> right we get the really small you know homestead level uh, in Emmons field where the village council is all men the women's circle is obviously all women and they're both doing their separate thing but working together and have equal influence right so this is this is how he's setting us up right from the start of the very first book. Uh, the second thing he's doing is reversing the Adam and Eve mythos, where you know in Christianity that Eve is the fallen one, etc., the tree of knowledge, all that business. Uh, in the Wheel of Time, it's the men who are fallen, and a man whose whose knowledge or power sort of end up breaking the world and causing a time of madness and, and awfulness. Um, and the result. Uh, you know, way number three, he's he's dealing with this. Our uh, women are elevated, while while men are um, kind of you know uh, distrusted a little bit. And this, this comes through not in everyday interactions so much as it does in in the systems of power and uh, the governing magical bodies, um, namely the the I as said I. So, um, you know. Female magicians are basically rule the world. Male magicians are captured and, and basically um, <laughs> magically castrated, sort of um, uh, gentled, uh, it's called. Um, so he goes, he being Robert Jordan, goes to great lengths uh, to make this really visible for the reader. Um, so the, the female magicians... Um, you know, the, the head of which is called the Armorlin seat is is basically the boss of everybody, right? Uh, how many times does Robert Jordan tell us that uh, kings kneel down to kiss the Armorlin's hand? <laughs> and he, he even uh, really goes to such obvious lengths. He wops the reader over the head with it. The 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 city where these female magicians live is called Tarvalin, and he, he puts up the map of it in in the book. And it's it's shaped like a vagina, <laughs> like for real, seriously. And this, <laughs> I don't. I gotta, I'll put this up for you here, but like, should I <laughs> should I blur it? I mean, it's just it's just um, an example of him being so explicit about how he's positioning uh, his world that it feels get a little silly or over the top. Um, you know, like, like, is YouTube gonna be mad at me about this? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so it's maybe a little on the ridiculous side. Um, way number four, uh, this this series passes the Bechdel test with just flying colors, right? So the Bechdel test is that uh, was meant for movies, I think, initially, um, uh, but it's so it's by Alison Bechdel, and the test is does the piece of work have two more than two or more female characters with names and do they have conversations with each other about something that's not uh, romantic or not about men uh, and yeah there are that this the series passes that infinitely right there are plenty of female characters with their own uh, agendas for example Elaine's agendas are mostly political Avienda's are, are mostly cultural and you know really invested in, in keeping her people uh, together and, and safe for the future. Um, uh, Egwene's uh, ambitions are, are, are also sort of political as well, with keeping the the Amelin seat or the the White Tower intact, etc. So so yeah, there are plenty of, of female characters with their own with their own agency and interests outside of outside of men. Uh, so yeah, a plus on that front, Robert Jordan. Good job, man. Way number five, he's, he's countering the kind of feminist critique of the fantasy genre is by making all the women just total, utter badasses, or most of them anyways, right? I mean, 
people are just throwing fireballs and rocks and knives around and, and just all these women are, are just utter badasses and, and uh, honestly it's kind of a relief it's kind of awesome um, okay so I just told you the really explicit ways sometimes too explicit ways that Robert Jordan is is setting up his series and his world uh, against a critique like the one that Ursula Gwynn is posing. Uh, and this episode's running a little long, so maybe in, in part two, uh, I'll tell you how he eventually kind of fucks it up. So, alright. Part two away.